And Father, at this time too, we also ask you to bless the message today. Father, that this message comes from you. Father, from your word. Use my voice, use my words. Father, but let it be your words that come through today. Would you teach us? And we're gonna give you the glory for that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've been talking about uh, a number of important words in our Christian faith. Words that may have special meaning to us. And we've been looking at what these words mean and looking at the expanded use of these words to make sure that we fully understand what they mean. And last week we finished up on worship. So if you were here the last couple weeks, you, we talked about worship and what it means. And it's that, it's that bowing down. And, and in a bowing down way, you, you're looking up at God. It's reverence to God. It's adoring the Father. And it's not done because he needs it. It's done because we need it. We're the ones that need to do this so that we know our place before God and we can properly give him the glory. What I wanted to point out to you here is when Jesus talked about worship and when he was uh, tested in the wilderness, Satan wanted Jesus to worship him. And Jesus simply said, look, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So this is the whole thing about worshiping God in the spirit and in truth. And we know in truth we worship and serve him only through his word. So worship is uh, an important response to grace, which we covered before that. And grace is, if you remember, we talked about grace being that divine intervention into your heart, into your life, and then you reflecting it back in your life. Remember we talked about that? In gratitude, that's all part of grace. Grace given, grace received, grace lived. All right? So grace and worship go, to ha go hand in hand, and worship is really a response to the grace of God. And so those become very important to us. The third word that I want to talk about today, I didn't tell you what it was. The reason why is because I want to, I want to give you a little bit of a background before I just throw this word out at you. Because uh, it, it, I think it will help us to understand where we're going if we get the background of our Christian faith first. And so we're going to fill in some boxes. All right? If we fill in the boxes... We're going to have a really good idea of what Christianity is. And then we can talk about this word that I want to talk about today. We're going to start in 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, he makes it very, very clear some very basic things for us, the gospel. And he wants people to know this is the gospel. All right, And so he says to them, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. So first of all, Paul preached this gospel, meaning the, God, the word means good news. He's preached the gospel to them. They have received it. Now, we've talked about this before, but what that simply means, they received it, which means they heard it, they understood it, and they believe it. That's what it means to receive. If they didn't believe it, they didn't receive it. Receiving the gospel message is they heard it, they understood it, they believed. And they receive that in which they've taken their stand. In fact, they believed it so much, they're willing to take a stand on it, defend it, believe it to the point where they can defend this gospel message because it's part of their heart. It's, it's that much of a belief. All right? He says, by this gospel, you are saved. So we are talking about the basic, simplest, and most important thing in the New Testament, the gospel that saves you. The gospel of Jesus that saves you. That's what we're talking about. He says, by this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly, which implies that maybe you receive it, but maybe one day you walk away from it and say, I don't know if I believe this anymore. No, he says, hold firmly. You've received it now. Hold firmly 
to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. And if you walk away from this thing, then you did all this for nothing, is what he's saying. He says, hold firmly, which is kind of a reference back to you have taken your stand. You've, you, you've believed to the point where you, are gonna, you can defend this thing and hold firmly to it. So he goes on and he explains what the gospel is. And this is not new to you. I've talked about this before. So this is a reminder. What I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. What I received. Paul had to go through the same process. Paul had to hear it, understand it, and then believe it. He received it. But he didn't receive it from the other apostles. He received it from Jesus face to face. Okay, that's a whole other discussion, but that's, that was how he received the gospel. I received, I passed on to you as a first importance, and what is that? That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Newsflash, right? I think we know that. Jesus Christ died for our sins. <clears throat> Nobody likes to talk about sin today. It's, it's an ugly word. Sin makes you feel bad. It makes it sound like, okay, there's judgment. Well, that's because sin causes death. I mean, that's what happened. Adam and Eve started this process. When they rejected God, God said, don't do it. If you take from this fruit, you're going to die. Well, guess what? People have been dying ever since. It's called the law of sin and death. Sin brings death. And, and I hope this is not a newsflash to you, but you have an appointment one day with death. We all do. Okay, but we can't die for our sins. We, we do die because of our sins, but we can't die for them. We can't right ourselves by dying. Jesus can because he lived a life without sin, so he can take our place. He takes your place. And even though your body dies, eternity is forever in the presence of God because Jesus died for your sins. That means your slate is clean. That means past, present, future. That means the people that had, weren't even alive yet, like us today, the sins have been, have been taken somewhere. You know where they were taken? Right here, that he was buried. So the first order of the gospel is that Christ died for our sins. The second order is that he was buried. And that's important because that's where our sins go, into the grave. And they stay there. They never come out again. Whatever you've done in life, you might think, God could never forgive me. I've done this terrible thing or whatever. You know what? To God, sin is sin. And he's taken it all to the grave. And it's, he left it there. You know why we know he left it there? Because the next order is that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He was raised, and he was raised without, he didn't drag your sins along. They stayed there in the grave. He came out of the grave a brand new person, a new prototype, a, a, a human and yet glorified human body that cannot die never been made before Jesus died for your sins to pay for them he took them to the grave he was raised from the dead all this on the third day all this according to the scriptures according to the Old Testament the Old Testament talks about all this stuff there's hundreds of, of prophecies that have to do with Jesus and, and what he did, whether it's dying on the cross, whether it's being the Messiah, whether it's uh, life into eternity. That's all talked about in the Old Testament. According to the scriptures, this is the gospel that saves us. Okay? According to the scriptures. And that he appeared. There's the next order of the gospel that Paul preached that saves us. He appeared to Cephas, who's Peter, and then to the twelve, and then he goes on and he talks about his appearance to hundreds of people. The risen Christ wasn't just seen by a couple of people. 
He was seen by hundreds of people. Why is that important? Well, it just adds the validity that he, it, it actually happened. And then other people could write it down so that we have it today. Do you see why that's so important? So the basic gospel that saves us is that Christ died for our sins. He was buried. That's where he took sins. He was raised. He appeared. And all of this kind of happens, it's pictured by baptism. You know, when we go through baptism and we go into the water, it's a watery grave. And we reenact the very same thing that Jesus did by going into a grave and leaving the old self behind and coming up out of the water, a brand new person. We leave the old person behind. Okay? And he appeared is, is the part of this whole thing that makes it so important that gives it validity, eyewitnesses. Okay? So the gospel of Jesus that saves, this is it. Christ died for our sins. Looks like my font is off a little bit. At home, it would fit just nice. I don't know. This computer didn't, isn't recognizing my font. He was buried. He was raised. He appeared to many eyewitnesses. That's the gospel. That's the gospel that saves. That's the, that's the thing right there that is the most important for us to know. Now, I get asked a lot by people who say, uh, Pastor, how... Why are there so many churches? Why are there so many churches that believe so many things? They can't all be right. They can't all be true. Why is there so many? Why is, why is Christianity not together? And, and a lot of non-believers will use that argument that, oh, well, you Christians are, are crazy because you've got all these different ideas going around. Why is that? Well, you know what? <laughs> the majority of our Christian brothers and sisters, whether you're Catholic, whether you're Protestant, whether you're Amish or Mennonite, whether you're Baptist, Anglican, uh, I can go down the list, right? They all hang on to the same thing. The thing that matters, that brings the church together, is the gospel of Jesus that saves. Now today, in this generation, there seems to be some breaking out of that. There's a little bit of rumblings going on where there are churches and beliefs that are starting to stray from this, which is really a shame. But if we, if we just kind of go back a little bit without this generation starting to do that, and be careful because that is happening. You go back a little bit to the churches, they all on board with this. This is the gospel that saves. Where do we have trouble? Where do we have differences between the churches? Well, it happens over then this side, and I'm going to call this the process. Okay? My words are going to run into this, I can tell. Okay? So we're going to have to, I don't know what's going to happen when I push the button, but anyways. <clears throat> the process of what we do after the gospel, the process is, is okay, Jesus died for our sins, and he, and he was buried, and he was risen. Now what? So the process begins with things like justification. Okay, these are big words. We've talked about all these. Being justified by God. Sanctification, being set apart for God. Glorification, that's the, that's the heavenly experience forever with God. So these three, this is where the churches usually differ. Okay, justification, uh, being declared not guilty. Uh, churches look at that differently and say, well, we, this is our view on that. Well, that's what it is. It's a view, okay? Uh, our view in His Grace Community Church and Grace Communion International is that we teach that God has done all of this. The gospel of Jesus is saved. That's all God. That's not you. That's not me. Justification, we teach that that's all God. Some churches believe that no, you, you're part of that formula. We teach that, no, that's all God. Sanctification, we teach that that's where you join the party. That's where you come in. Once you're justified and once you understand the gospel, now what? How are you supposed to live? What are you supposed to be doing with your life? That's kind of a rough 
uh, idea on sanctification. Glorification, the heavenly experience. Well, some churches, you know, we're talking about heaven and hell, and we're talking about, you know, the afterlife. There's all kinds of differences going on between churches. But understand this. It's the process where the differences are. It's not the gospel. The gospel is agreed upon by the majority of our Christian brothers and sisters around the world. Okay, they might have a little different flavor of it, but this is what this is the gospel of Jesus that saves right here. Okay? Justification. Um, that's we teach that God does that. God does this, God does that. Sanctification is where we come into play and where we begin to um, experience God in our lives. Okay? And that's the word we're going to look at today. That's the word we're adding to our list. Sanctification. We don't use the word sanctification. When was the last time you used the word sanctification? Right. I mean, so it's a theological word that explains how we live. Now that we've been, now that the saving grace has been given, now that justification has been given, now what? What do we do with our lives? Sanctification. All right? And sanctification is an act of, after worship and grace, it's like, now what? Now we're going to work into, okay, here's how we need to live our lives. You ready for that? That's where we're going. Sanctification. What does it mean? Well, the Greek word, okay? Hagiazo. Did I say that right, Francis? Hagiazo? I've been practicing. Hagiazo. Say it with me. Hagiazo. And I've talked about this word before. This isn't the first time we talked about it. But what does that word mean in the Greek? Because we have the word in English, sanctification, but what does the Greek word really mean? And so it means to make holy, purify or consecrate, to venerate, and it can be used for words like hallow, be holy, or sanctify. All right? So this one here, to make holy, does that scare you? To, to make holy? I mean, do you look at yourself and say, God's making me holy? And holy, H, not, not W, you know, not, or not with holes in me. I mean, <laughs> it's... <laughs> <laughs> he's making us holy. So that sounds like this is something that God is doing. Right? In, in, when we talk about ceremony, ceremony is our way of, you know, here what we, we practice two sacraments. We practice communion as a sacrament and we, we practice baptism. And uh, both of those are important for the gospel message. And when it comes to ceremony, that's just one way that we celebrate the fact that God is sanctifying us and making us holy. Okay? Uh, how about this one? Purify or consecrate? Purify. Being purified is a process. A process of removing impurities in life. That takes time. That takes a lifetime. All right? And consecrate means to set apart. You consecrate you set apart for a special use. Some of you ladies made food today. And if you, let's say you make a cake, okay? And somebody at home wants a piece of that cake, you can slap their hand. No, that's set apart. That's for church. <laughs> you don't dare touch that. That's set apart. For, that's con you consecrated your cake. <laughs> you set it apart, Okay? And if you've had to do that, well, then you've consecrated. So that's <laughs> setting apart. That means apart from what? What do we set apart from? Well, we're going to get to that. To venerate. Venerate. To make right. To make it right. To, to venerate. All of those sound like things that God does. So, and I said, we, we're, we're part of the, where are we in this formula, right? <laughs> where are we? Because it still sounds like it's all God. He's doing all of this. He does justification. And we enter in at sanctification, but we're not seeing it yet. So let's, let's discover 
what that might mean. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. Paul here, talking to the church in Thessalonica, he says this, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. You don't sanctify yourself. God sanctifies you. God consecrates and sets you apart. God makes you holy. God is doing this. God himself, the God of peace. Through and through, that means like head to toe, everything. How do I know that? Well, because he says, may your whole spirit, soul, and body, there's nothing missing there. That's everything that you got. Okay, body, we get that. Soul, okay, our being. Spirit, do you, do you realize that when Paul talks about spirit, and he's not talking about the Holy Spirit, he's talking about the spirit in man? God has given us, because we're made after his image, we're, we're given this ability to understand things. Animals don't have that. We have the ability to, to create. We have the ability to, to use logic and talk and to just all kinds of things. That's what... What Paul refers to is our spirit, our spirit in man. All of that, spirit, soul, and body, right? Through and through. You are sanctified, you are set apart. To be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I understand blameless because Jesus died for our sins. But he says to be kept blameless. Because after you're baptized, after you realize you jump on board and you say, yep, sign me up, and now you're a Christian and you're going through life, do you ever sin? Yeah. We still sin, don't we? We're still human. Jesus has died for all those sins, but there's something about being kept blameless. How does that work? And at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the early church, you'll see that often in Paul's letters. They really did believe that Jesus was going to return in their, their generation. They really did believe that. And so they often said things to do this so that we're ready at the coming of Jesus. They didn't say so that we're ready when we die. No, they really, at the coming of Jesus, this was, this was how they looked at things and why they used those phrases. But to be kept blameless because you're going to stand before Christ and you don't want to be blamed. You, you want to be blameless. So how's God, God going to make you holy and keep you blameless? How's he going to do that? All right? The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. You will not. So where do we come in? Well, let's, let's talk about that because if we're joining the party here at sanctification and God is still looks like he's doing everything, what are we doing? Well, we go back, we go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and Paul says this. He says, For we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as firstfruits to be saved Remember the gospel that saves. Remember the gospel. Jesus died for your sins. He was buried. He was raised. He appeared. Remember all that, right? He chose you as first fruits, the first ones to be saved through something. Through what? How about through the sanctifying work of the Spirit? It's the Spirit that's working in you to keep you blameless, to set you apart and a couple other things that we're going to see here. He says, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and, this is where you come in, and through belief in the truth. Remember what he said about holding on? Remember what he said about taking a stand? You know, you may have to take a stand one day. You may have to take a stand one day when, when, when you are confronted with the gospel and being a believer. And lots of people have been confronted by this. But to, to, to have that through belief in the truth to be able to hang on, that's the beginning of your part right there. Belief in the truth. Belief. Remember? Receiving, hearing, understanding, 
believing. Really, really important. All right? It's believing in the truth. And also, we have the sanctifying work of the Spirit. So, what does that mean? What work is the Spirit doing? Well, let's go back to Paul. And he says this. He called you to this through our gospel. Remember the gospel? He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The glory. That's glorification. The, the risen Christ, the new body that doesn't die. Anybody want a body that doesn't die and doesn't get sick and no hospitals? Would you like that? Yeah. Well, when you share in his glory, he's talking about his new, his new person, resurrected Christ, that you might share in that, that glory of, Je- of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's through the gospel. He says, so then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast, remember? Stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, which is the gospel, but there's more than the gospel as well, the teachings we pass on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. So there's our part of standing firm and holding fast, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. What's he going to do? He's encourage your heart. What is the spirit, work of the spirit? He's going to encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. The spirit is going to encourage your hearts We're talking about something above what you have now, an ability to be encouraged when you shouldn't be encouraged. But God's Spirit is able to work with your heart and encourage you in a in a supernatural way and strengthen you, strengthen you with something beyond what you have humanly. Strength to do what? Every good deed and word. You're going to need strength in every good deed and word how you live your life, how you live out your Christian faith. You're going to need some strength. Okay? The work of the Spirit is going to strengthen you. It's going to encourage your hearts. And when you add to the part we saw before, you're saved through the sanctifying of the work of the Spirit to encourage and strengthen you. And then your part is to believe the truth And then you're going to live it out in deed and word because he's going to encourage and strengthen you. So what does that look like? What does that look like, this sanctification? This is is where we together with God are living our lives as he is making us holy and setting us apart. Setting us apart from what? What is he setting us apart from? When I was young... um, one of the TV shows that was on that was popular at the time was the Dick Van Dyke Show. How many remember the Dick Van Dyke Show? Yeah, everybody back then. If, if you're not familiar with Dick Van Dyke, you're probably younger than me. Or you don't watch re- reruns. The Dick Van Dyke Show had a couple things in it that were pushing the envelope. And when television came along and the, the people across the nation are able to see on their TV screens and are able to see things that might be pushing what you think of as normal. And television had a way of doing that. And it still does, yeah. But back in the early 60s, when this was going on, there was a couple things that really pushed the envelope, okay? So Rob, oh, that's not where I was going. I got ahead of myself. Yeah, I got ahead of myself. Okay, okay, hold on. Let me get to, here we go. All right, okay. I jumped ahead. I'm so anxious. Uh, Laura introduced kind of an idea, and that is that it's okay to wear slacks. You see, women back then, they all wore dresses. When I was in school, all the little girls wore dresses. And it's not that girls didn't wear slacks. I mean, if you were working on the farm or you had something going on, you had slacks. But as an everyday thing, you wearing slacks? You mean it's okay to wear slacks? Laura does. Now, think about that. That sounds silly right now. But 
back then, that was kind of a push in the envelope. The other thing that was pushing the envelope on that show is a lot of the scenes that were shot were either in um, the living room, the kitchen, or the bedroom, right? Well, the producers of the show had a problem on their hands because here you have Rob and Laura, a married couple, and they have, you know, they had these discussions going on in the bedroom. And if, if they put them in the same bed, the, the nation would have been up in arms. Not that marriage isn't celebrated and, and therefore it would be okay. It's that Dick Van Dyke and Mary Tyler Moore were not married. And to see them in the same bed would have been like, you can't do that. Right? They still couldn't do that. They, they had to, the best they could do is have a, 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 a nightstand with a light that they shared. And, and here's a new concept, TV. TV in your bedroom. <laughs> yeah. You mean you could have, your, everybody looked at that. That is so cool. I've got to get one of those in our bedroom, right? So I say this because, because we're going to go back. Now I've got to go backwards. Okay. Now we're going to go backwards. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't make sense to go backwards. Okay, I'll come back to this in a second. Okay, there we go. Because culture is a terrible place to go to find out what things are acceptable in life. Culture is shifting and changing all the time. You can't rely on culture to tell you these things. Uh, the picture I have here is a picture of uh, the desert. Let me back up. Sorry about that. This is the Judean des uh, desert wilderness. It's on the west bank of the, of the Jordan River. And it's uh, right there. This is uh, Jerusalem right here. And it would have been this region right here above the Qumran community. Uh, this is the Jordan River. And you've heard of the West Bank, perhaps? The West Bank of the, of the uh, Jordan River, which is where John probably did his ministry, where uh, Jesus certainly uh, went to this wilderness to be tested by Satan. It could, have been, it could have been in one of these spots. We don't know. But it would have been in this region. I want you to notice that that region is, uh, boy, there's not much life there, is there? There's um, uh, nothing much that lives. The sand is, uh, is kind of shifting. Um, and it's interesting that Jesus went to a place like this, not a place of luxury, to be tested by Satan. And this was the beginning of his ministry, wasn't it? He had been baptized, not for his sins, for ours. He had been baptized, and immediately he went to this testing place. Now, this area is where Satan would have elevated him to the pinnacle of the temple or to the high mountain to see the, the nations of the world. It would have been wonderful. It would have been beautiful because Satan can make look, anything look beautiful. But the reality, this is where he was. Can I tell you that you and I, we're in this all, all the time. Did you know that? It might look beautiful outside because of God's creation, but the reality of the spirit of this world is we're living in a culture, okay? We're living in a culture of uh, death. Looks like Death Valley, doesn't it? And a culture that's always changing, a culture that, um, that is not a very good place to go when you want to find out what things are right to do in life because it's changing, okay? That's where I was getting into, you know, the changing culture with Rob and Laura, okay? So <clears throat> what, what God is calling us to is to be in a place where we're not relying on culture like Jesus did not. He withstood Satan. He said, you know, worship the Lord and, and, and serve him only. And after the end of that test... The angels came and, and ministered to him, and he began his ministry. But he had to go through that first. But can I tell you that, that when you go out the door, you're walking, into, you're walking into a place like this. God doesn't remove you from it. 
but he gives you something while you're in it. And that's where sanctification comes in. Sanctification is a call for us to live to a higher standard. We are called to live to a higher standard than culture. We are called to live by a difference. The culture is shifting and changing and, and based on the world. And sanctification is based on Jesus' teachings. And these don't change. Our understanding improves as we understand it better and better. But this is a rock. It doesn't change. The shifting sands of wilderness do, and our culture does. So sanctification is a call for us to live at a higher standard than the world around us. How are we going to do that? Remember Jim Kavitzel? We did the um, testimony, Jim's testimony a few months back. He's the actor that played Jesus in the movie The Passion, blockbuster movie, one of the biggest selling movies of all time. And it changed Jim's life. And he's done all these testimonies, and I've listened to several, and he has a quote that he, he uses in just about, and I think in every testimony I've ever heard him give, he uses this quote. He says, you weren't born to fit in. You were born to stand out. Fitting into the world might sound like a good idea if you're thinking, well, if I'm like them, then maybe I can help them to come along and become a believer. Well, be careful with that. We're not made to fit into the world. Okay, Jesus is going to help us with that and understand that in a second. Jim's life was changed when he did that movie. I mean, completely changed. And he goes around giving talks, and he is very big into this sanctification, living the Christian life in a wilderness that we're in. All right? Jesus said this to his disciples. And the night he was betrayed, he's saying a prayer. All of John 17 is Jesus' prayer to the Father. He's praying for his disciples, and he's praying for you because he mentions you in John 17, believe it or not. And this is what he says. My prayer to the Father, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one because that's where he is. That's where Jesus met him right there in that countryside. Not to take us out of the world, out of the culture, but to protect them from the evil one. He says, they are not of the world even as I am not of it. We're in it, but we're not of it. Sanctification is a call to live at a standard above the world. If the world says something's okay to do, you might want to look into that. You want to look at God's word and see, is that what God says? You're not of the world, okay? When he goes on, he says, sanctify them. Jesus is asking the Father to sanctify the disciples and those who would follow on based on his message, and that's you, to sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. This is the standard, not the world, not the culture, this is what we stand on, what it says in here. We're called to a higher standard. He says, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. <laughs> when you go out that door today, you're stepping out into the world. This is like a little oasis. At church, we're kind of, it's a little different culture, isn't it? Isn't church a little different culture? Yeah. And when we step out into the world, it's, it's different. We're in an oasis today. But we have to go out into the world. And, and, and it's not that he's taking us away from the world. It's not that he's saying, don't go there. No, we're set apart to go there. We are absolutely sanctified to go there. For them, I sanctify myself. Jesus can say that because he's God. Okay. <laughs> that they too may be truly sanctify truly what to make holy to to set apart or consecrate to to uh, be purified if you're doing those things you're going to stand out you're going to stand out and people are going to see that 
If you're trying to fit in, you might be trying to go under this. He says that they too may truly be sanctified. So our call is to live a higher standard than culture, than the things around us that tell us that things are okay. I want you to take this away today because <clears throat> next week I'm going to talk about a little more detail what, what kind of examples we're talking about. But I want you to understand this starting point, and that is the sanctifying work of the Spirit and the belief in truth. This is the two parts that we come into play, right? The work of the Spirit is to encourage you and strengthen you. Why? Because you're going out there. That's why. Jesus was strengthened when he faced Satan in, in the wilderness, wasn't he? I mean, he was in his weakest human condition from fasting, but he was in his strongest condition because the Spirit strengthened him. And that's what happens in sanctification is to strengthen you so that you can, don't fit in, but stand out. Strengthen and encourage you. For us, it's all about believing in the truth, the gospel message that saves. Believe that, take your stand on it, and don't back down. And then, every good deed and word, we're able to live our lives according to what we see in this standard, according to the teachings of Jesus. We're able to do our life strengthened by the Holy Spirit, the work of the Spirit, so that even in every deed and word in our lives, we may end up standing out. But that's okay. That's why you're strengthened to do that. God doesn't want to see you in a wilderness. The wilderness is a place of death. I'm not complaining about our, our neighborhood, by the way. We, we live in a beautiful place here. But underneath all of that, we have this culture of the world that it's easy for us to fit into. And God didn't make us to fit into it. We're supposed to stand out from it. We're supposed to live at a higher standard. God wants you to be in a Garden of Eden. Do you notice the, the Garden of Eden is where there's life, there's, there's beauty, and that's the place of God. And, and, and the, the, the culture, the, the, the world, is not a place of God. It's a place where he has to strengthen you so you can go into it. Okay? So think about that this week, and next week we'll talk about some more examples about what it is to live a sanctified life, all right? But praise God that he has given us his gospel and that he gives us the strength to live in this world. And you will stand out. That's okay. That's some of the best outreach there is. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from last week? Did they stand out? Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. We may have moments like that, too. Praise God and ask for his strength every day. Father, we praise you today and we thank you. We thank you for strengthening us. We thank you for encouraging us, sending the Spirit to do that in our hearts. We thank you for your gospel message, Father, that saves us, the gospel of your Son, Jesus. And we hang on to that. Father, we believe it. We hang on to it. We're going to defend it. We're going to stand on it. Father, that's where we need to be. And Father, as we step out into the world and as we get choices every day, things that we have to choose, Father, give us the strength to choose the right thing that you give us to know the right thing. And if we get it wrong, Father, lift us up to try again and teach us because we need to be taught. And so, Father, teach us those right things so that we can stand on the truth. Father, we ask for that kind of strength, that kind of encouragement this very week. Would you bless us as we go and do that? And we're going to give you praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name, our Savior, the one who saves us, the one we're hanging on to. It's in his name we pray. Amen.